Good evening to all of you. We're very glad that you're here. If you will take a Bible and open it back with me to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11 is where we're going to be. Hopefully you already had material that you picked up last Wednesday or this past Sunday. But if you have not, it is available just outside of the doors there. Lesson number 12 for this evening and lesson number 13, our last lesson in this quarter uh, also for next Wednesday evening. We're glad that you're here and we have a whole lot of ground to cover. And so we're going to get right into it. Uh, we want to begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get into our study of Daniel chapter 11. If you will, bow with me. Let's pray together. Our great God and Father who is in heaven, we praise you this evening as the God who reigns over all. You are sovereign. You are truly awesome. There is no God besides you. There is no human being or group of human beings who can obstruct your will or, or frustrate your purposes. And, and we're in awe of that and we take great comfort in that fact, even this evening. We thank you for this ancient prophecy of Daniel. We thank you for the incredible scope of his prophecy you demonstrating so very clearly that you know the end from the beginning. You reign over all, all men and women, all empires and kingdoms. You reign over history, you reign over time, and we submit ourselves to you this evening. Bless us as we open up your word and study from it. Help us to grow in our awe of who you are and what you have done on behalf of humanity. It's in the name of Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that we pray this evening. Amen. Daniel chapter 11 is where we're going to be. I have got to tell you that Daniel 11 has been on my mind for months. I have never taught through Daniel 11, and I have got to tell you that I think it is probably the most difficult chapter to teach in the entire Old Testament. And if you don't know why, just uh, hang with me for about five or ten minutes and you'll, you'll figure it out relatively quickly. This is an absolutely incredible chapter. But in order to teach it, uh, it is just a, a tremendous hurdle that we're going to try and clear this evening. As you can see at the top of our material, Daniel 11 is a continuation of the massive final vision that Daniel was receiving. We began that last Wednesday evening in Daniel 10, and we'll, we'll notice where we were in just a few moments. But this Daniel 11 contains 130 predictions one way or another, okay? We're dealing with an absolutely incredible chapter. It is so detailed and so accurate that it has come to be one of the biggest pieces of evidence, or so-called evidence, for skeptics who would say there is no way that a man in 536 B.C. could make these predictions Therefore, Daniel could not have been written in the 500 B.C.s. It must have been written somewhere in the teens or 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s B.C., somewhere around that, because there's just no way that a human being in 536 could have predicted what is clearly revealed. Now, you and I understand, Daniel was not able to do that on Daniel's own. There was a mind behind that, and we appreciate that fact. But what we're going to do, what we're going to learn is how in the world we go from the days of the major and the minor prophets to the situation that existed in the days of Jesus. There is a massive difference between, for instance, Malachi, the, the climate politically and socially and religiously in the days of those latter prophets and what is going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But in order to understand that, we're dealing with about 400 years worth of history. And that's a whole lot of history. 
There, there's no doubt about it. And so we understand that, that really what is going on is God is revealing to Daniel very difficult days that are going to come. We've already touched on that in a variety of different ways, but God continues to show Daniel what is to come. And what we're going to see is the promised land of Israel. It's been and it will be referred to in Daniel 11 as the glorious land, right? This was the land that God had promised to Abraham and Abraham's descendants had come to dwell in. We're just going to see it like right in the middle of a tug of war over and over and over again. It's one thing for you and for me to study that historically. It would be another thing to live that. Right? You imagine living, for instance, in Missouri, let's say, and uh, the eastern half of the United States being one nation and the western half of the United States being another nation, and Missouri just back and forth, a, a terrible battleground, back and forth. That was reality for Israel in this era of 100, 200, 300, 400 B.C., and that is what God is revealing to Daniel is going to happen. This area, as a result of the world, is so rich in history and archaeology. Just as one example from about a week and a half ago, you may have heard the news that in northern Israel, in a cave, some men found artifacts from the days of Alexander the Great. And it makes news every time it happens, but it happens all the time because this was a, a nexus where so many different empires would perpetually meet. And so you've got shepherds and archaeologists and ordinary people who just routinely find incredible things that are 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 years old. That's where we are in Daniel chapter 11. We left off in Daniel 10. Remember this great heavenly being. We said it sounds an awful lot like Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. We know this is a more awesome being than even the angels that have communicated with Daniel. And that heavenly being ended in what we have as Daniel 10. Do you know why I have come to you? Speaking to Daniel. But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Now remember, Daniel did not stop with Daniel 10 and move on to Daniel 11. It's an odd break there that probably should never have been. Daniel 11 in verse 1 just continues that heavenly speaker saying, And as for me in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. We spent 45 minutes last week just emphasizing over and over again, there is always more going on than meets the human eye. Right? And we had ample evidence of that in Daniel 10. And now this incredible heavenly being continues. I will show you the truth. Just to get the proper framework in our minds. Why does God keep telling Daniel the truth in all of its pain and all of its heartache and heartbreak that is coming? Why does God keep showing Daniel these things, do you think? We've already touched on one thing. I mean, it is incredible apologetic evidence, right, of a great mind behind all of this. Dwayne? It's all part of the plan. Yeah. I think he just wants to reconfirm to Daniel, there's going to be some choppy waters, but in the end, yeah. it's as I planned. Yeah. God has not forgotten the promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And we strategically put in a sermon a couple of Sunday nights ago just re-emphasizing that God doesn't work on our timetable, right? It doesn't fit into a nice, neat, little 30-minute package for us. But God knows 
exactly what is happening. He knows who is going to happen and what's going to happen and when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen. And this is one of the most incredible sections in all of the Bible to show us that truth. Jason, go ahead. Well, just also we've seen already the influence that yeah. Daniel's had. And just throughout that influence, how they've been able to share and the commentary he's made to these people is influenced about yeah. what he understands. And, you know, so just to further enable that. Even, so. Sure. To be a comfort to his fellow Jews and to be a witness to Gentiles that there is a God in heaven and earth who reigns over all. Andrew? Continuation of what uh, Jason just said. Um, his, the people that are listening to Daniel, because mm -hmm. he's proven and everything, and they've been through some really hard times to yeah. get to this point. They've seen kingdom fall, they've been persecuted, they've been dragged off in captivity. This, this is, they've been beaten very low. Yeah. And it's going to get better, but God's being absolutely clear, it's going to get even worse. Right. And so he starts describing the low point, and it's not the Babylonian captivity, it's it's to come. Yeah. And then he'll get better. Exactly. And it's all going to culminate, of course, remember where we left off in Daniel chapter 9, with the atoning sacrifice for sin. We're building up to Jesus. But there's a whole lot of stuff that happens between the days of Daniel and the days of Jesus. Daniel was a teenager in the Babylonian Empire. He is a very old man now in the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire is about to come to an end. That is where this chapter begins. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. You don't have to believe in the Bible to go back and look at the chronicles that are so very well preserved for us in history to know who that fourth king was. Historically, we know him either as Xerxes I or that king in the days of Esther. What, what is he named in Esther chapter 1? Ahasuerus or Ahasuerus, right? Same man, okay? Ahasuerus or Xerxes the first. And he was indeed a very wealthy, powerful man, okay? He rules over this entire Persian empire. Remember, Babylon was impressive, but it was nothing compared to to the Persian Empire that now Xerxes the first or Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus will, will reign over. However, there is a threat growing in the West. And that threat is Greece. And that is what this heavenly being is allowing Daniel to see. When that fourth king has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Now, just pause and think about this for a moment. In 536 BC, as Daniel is hearing this, the idea of Greece being an incredible world empire is kind of like saying Iowa is going to grow strong and conquer the world. You know, it just boggles the mind. How in the world would that ever happen? And yet God knows it's going to happen, right? Eventually, a mighty king shall arise. We know that young man as Alexander. Alexander the Great. Very, very good. So far, so good. He's a very young man, and he is able to push from Greece all the way to the east and have an incredible impact on the world. He shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven. An incredible young man who dies at 33 years old. All right? And so... Suddenly now, this new world power is on the scene, but it's broken. 
And it begins to fracture. It's divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity. It is not a, a son or a grandson, obviously, of Alexander the Great who comes on the scene. Eventually, his great kingdom is divided up amongst four Grecian generals. And you see those reflected here, okay? Seleucus, we'll talk much more about in just a moment. Ptolemy, Antigonus, and Cassander over here, okay? We've got that massive empire divided up amongst Alexander the Great's generals. And what we've got after Alexander the Great, first of all, you see that third bullet point. I gave you these names just because some of them are difficult. Seleucus. Alexander's empire eventually gets divided up and the two that directly relate to Israel, Israel's just right down here, this small section of land. The two that really have an impact on that promised land is Seleucus I in what is known as Syria. Syria was much bigger than modern day Syria today. He is referred to as the king of the north and Ptolemy the first. All of these statues and busts and everything are incredibly preserved all over the world. In museums here in this country, in museums throughout Europe and Asia and Africa, it's absolutely incredible that this has been preserved for us. But what we've got is these two men, one to the north and to the east in Syria, and one to the west and the south in Egypt. And from the time of Alexander's death, these two, Syria in the north, Egypt in the south, are constantly at war. This is where it gets a little complicated, okay? But just try and stay with me as much as is possible, and we'll come back up for air in just a moment. Syria goes to war against Egypt to establish dominance of this major thoroughfare of the known world, okay? In Daniel 11 and verse 5, then the king of the south, we know those as the Ptolemies down here in Egypt, the king of the south shall be strong. But one of his princes shall be stronger than he. The way that history goes, Seleucus in Syria initially is met with hostility by Antagonus, the first. And he's forced to run from Syria down into Egypt. So you've got this major player who at first is at war over here. And in order to get some sanctuary, he comes down here. And he comes to be known for a little while as Ptolemy's prince. Okay? And he's down there for about four years before finally defeating Antagonus up there in the Grecian area, he regains control over Syria. And what ends up happening is he grows to be stronger than Ptolemy in the south. So you got that? Syria is in trouble against those western forces. He flees down to Egypt. And while he's down there, he reestablishes his authority and in fact grows stronger than Ptolemy down in the south, which leads to nearly unending war. We fast forward about 75 years after the death of Alexander the Great. Daniel 11 verse 6 simply describes it as, after some years, Ptolemy the second, again, think Egypt in the south, offers a peace treaty to those Syrians in the northeast, he offers it to Antiochus II, trying to make an, an alliance between the south and the east. And the way this man does that is to say, why don't you marry my daughter, Bernice? Okay, so struggles between the south and the east. And this man has a daughter named Bernice. And he says, why don't you in Syria marry my daughter? That's what's going on in verse 6. After some years, they shall make an alliance and the daughter of the king of the south. Incredible that historically we even know her name. 
right? She shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the strength of her arm. And he and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up and her attendants, he who fathered her and he who supported her in those times. Now, this is where it begins to be kind of like a soap opera. Problem is, this guy's already married, okay? He's at war with this guy. Syria's at war with Egypt. But he's already married, and he wants an alliance. So he gets the bright idea. I'm going to divorce my current wife and disinherit my two sons. And he does so. And he's married to Bernice for about two years. His wife, as you can imagine, doesn't like all of that. <laughs> And so she poisons him. She, she poisons him and arranges for her son to eventually not only grow to, to be in great authority, but also to murder Bernice. And so you've got Ptolemy II down here in Egypt. He says to this man in Syria, why don't you marry my daughter? He divorces his wife and disinherits his two sons. But after two years, his wife, who is not pictured, poisons him, gets her son to kill Bernice. And guess what we've got now again? War, right? We had a very fragile alliance, but now we've got war once again. All right? Let me go back here. While all of that is happening, while this... this a uh, terrible triangle is unfolding before the deaths of these three people uh, or before uh, he and, and she are murdered. This man dies of natural causes. Remember, this was her father. He, he is Ptolemy II. Ptolemy III comes to reign in Egypt. Now think about this. Bernice is his sister. He doesn't like the fact that his sister has been murdered, as you can imagine. And so what does he do? He comes out of Egypt and he goes to war again. Who's caught in the middle over and over and over again between Syria and Egypt? You got it. It's Israel. Over and over and over again. Ptolemy III avenges his sister's assassination by coming out of Egypt, invading Syria, seizing the capital city of Antioch. Ptolemy goes back from Syria with 40,000 talents of silver. He takes out of Syria, back down to Egypt, 40,000 talents of silver, 2,500 idols that he carries back as a sign of his power. That's Daniel 11, 7, and 8. From a branch, from her roots, the her being Bernice, it is a branch of her roots. It's a very poetic way of describing, not her father, but her brother, right? A branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north. And he shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods. God tells us that hundreds of years before that. History tells us this man, Ptolemy III, carries away 2,500 idols 40,000 talents of gold, and for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. All right? So, Egypt has the upper hand for a little while. Meanwhile, this man named Seleucus II isn't going to allow that to stand for very long. He retaliates with an invasion of Egypt. But it doesn't go well. Daniel 11 verse 9. Then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south. But shall return to his own land. 
His sons shall wage war and assemble a multitude of great forces which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through and again shall carry the war as far as his fortress. Once again, why is this being brought up? It's because the land of Israel is right smack dab in the middle of all of this. Ptolemy the third, or Ptolemy the fourth, I should say, dies. Let me make sure I've got this right. See, I told you it's challenging. In 217 BC, Antiochus the third, pictured here, he's from Syria. Okay, Syria has tried to invade Egypt. It doesn't go well. Daniel tells us even some of this man's sons are going to press the war. In 217, Antiochus III meets Ptolemy IV in battle. All right? Those two men are pictured. Syria in the east, over here. Ptolemy, Egypt in the south. 217, they meet in battle. And Ptolemy this time, the Egyptian is victorious. He suffers 2,200 casualties. Antiochus suffers 17,000. And so once again, the tables flip. Now, this is Egyptian territory, Ptolemy territory. Okay, just back and forth, back and forth. That's Daniel 11, verses 11 and 12. Then the king of the south, this man, moved with rage, shall come out and fight against the king of the north, and he shall raise a great multitude, but it shall be given into his hand. And when the multitude is taken away, his heart shall be exalted, and he shall cast down tens of thousands, but he shall not prevail. Eventually that man, Ptolemy IV, dies under very suspicious circumstances. In 203 BC, he's only in his 30s, when he dies, Ptolemy the fifth, his son, is only six years old at the time. And so guess what Syria sees? This man who was very strong for a while dies in his 30s. His natural born son is only six, which means we over here in Syria see an opportunity. Antiochus the third exploits the crisis by coming into Egypt in 200 B.C. Daniel 11, verse 13, For the king of the north shall again raise a multitude greater than the first, and after some years he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. Where do they go to get down there? Right through the heart of Israel, right through Jerusalem that is built on those major, major thoroughfares. And what we've got is just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But now we're into the 100 AD or the 100 BC years. And guess who is rising in the West? It's Rome, right? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There have been fragile alliances and they just will not hold. And Jerusalem and Judea are right in the middle of all of it. Meanwhile, no one is looking over their shoulder to the west, to Rome, that is slowly growing in power. To his credit, this man, Antiochus III, sees something happen. Okay, Daniel 11, verse 14, we'll get to him in a moment. In those times, many shall arise against the king of the south, and the violent among your own people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. Then the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city, and the forces of the, the south shall not stand, or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills. Someone is growing over there in the west, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his hand. This man, Antiochus III, sees what is beginning to happen far to the west in Rome. And so to try and hedge his bets with this empire and fortify himself against this empire, 
he decides to try and give his daughter, her name was Cleopatra, the first, not the Cleopatra you're thinking of, a different Cleopatra. He gives his daughter as a wife to Ptolemy the fifth down here. This man's daughter is only 16 at the time. And so in order to try and smooth everything over, especially if Rome is growing in the West, maybe if we unite forces, we'll be able to withstand this army. This man, Antiochus III, gives his daughter, 16 years old, to be the bride of Ptolemy V. But Cleopatra, his daughter, convinces her husband to align with Rome. It backfires over here. This man, the Syrian, says, maybe we can team up. I'll give you my daughter. His 16-year-old daughter must not have been a daddy's girl because she convinces her husband to align with Rome and to go against the Syrians. Daniel 11 and the 17th verse of the chapter, he shall set his face to come with the strength of his whole kingdom and he shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. He shall give him the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom, but it shall not stand or be to his advantage. At the encouragement of a famous general you've probably heard of before, Hannibal the first, you've heard that name before. Hannibal is Antiochus III, one of his generals over here in Syria. He moves to attack Greece. The problem is Greece is now protected by the Roman Empire. His own daughter has betrayed him. Ptolemy has aligned with Rome. So Syria, Antiochus III, pushes against Greece, and it does not go well. In 192, famous battle of Thermopylae, you may have heard that. The Syrians against the Romans, the Syrians are pushed back. He is delivered a crushing blow. He loses 70,000 men in that battle. In 189, he signs a treaty with Rome that requires him to submit to Rome as a kind of vassal king. He's got to pay a huge tribute every single year. It leaves him and the Syrian Empire absolutely broke. He is ordered never to cross mountains in modern day Turkey. Two years later, he's trying to plunder an ancient temple in Persia in order to pay the Romans because he pushed against them and he's murdered. And Syria really is never the same again. Seleucius IV, or let me read verses 18 and 19 that encapsulate what we just talked about. Afterward, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture many of them, but a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. Then he shall turn his face back toward the fortresses of his own land, trying to rob a temple in order to pay the Romans, but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. So Lucius IV inherits the throne when Antiochus III dies, the throne of this Seleucid Empire. He still has to pay the Romans, but what do you do? You no longer have any sort of a relationship with Egypt down here. Rome says, don't cross these mountains. You pay us a huge sum of money every single year or we're going to come in and wipe you out. And so here is this man who has inherited not only a broken empire, but a huge yearly debt, and I've got to get the money somewhere. Where am I going to get it? Jerusalem. Jerusalem still has some things to be plundered. And so he sends his generals down to Jerusalem to try and get enough to pay the Romans. Daniel 11 and verse 20. Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken neither in anger nor in battle. He does not reign very long. He is poisoned in 175. His brother Antiochus IV is the one who comes onto the throne. And if you were paying attention several weeks ago, 
Perhaps you even recognize that picture, a bust that is in a museum in Berlin of this man, Antiochus. We don't know exactly uh, all of the circumstances. It is his brother who is poisoned and murdered. Antiochus has been in Rome. He is in Athens when the assassination of his brother, the, the broken king, takes place. It's thought perhaps he was even involved in the conspiracy. And this is how this man rises to power of this Seleucid Empire. His brother has already raided Jerusalem in order to get some tribute. And this man is a wicked, wicked, wicked man. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 21. In his place shall arise a contemptible person. That's this man, Antiochus IV to whom royal majesty has not been given. The throne, the royal line did not go his way. But he sees an opportunity. It's thought perhaps he was even involved in the conspiracy to murder his own brother. And there's a vacuum and he fills it. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken even the prince of the covenant. And from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully and he shall become strong with a small people. Remember, this is not the biggest empire. This is the most broken empire of those major ones that we've talked about. But Jerusalem, Judea, is right there on his doorstep and he's going to take full advantage of it. Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his father's fathers have done, scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south, with a great army, and the king of the south shall wage war war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. For plot shall be devised against him. Even those who eat his food shall break him. His army shall be swept away, talking about the king of the south, and many shall fall down slain. And as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail. For the end is yet to be at the time appointed. And he shall return to his land, this Antiochus IV, with great wealth, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant. And he shall work his will and return to his own land. We referenced several weeks ago that while Antiochus is down in Egypt waging war, there is a rumor that circulates in Jerusalem that Antiochus IV has died. And that emboldens the Jewish people. They think, okay, finally our enemy to the, to the east has been eliminated. Antiochus already has people who are very loyal to him in Jerusalem. He has removed the Jewish high priest and installed a high priest of his own choosing. There is this rumor that he has died in Egypt and on his way back, he stops in Jerusalem and makes his wrath felt. In Jerusalem, on his way back, on a Sabbath day, multiple historical witnesses tell us that he massacres 80,000 men, women, and Jewish children on a Sabbath day. He stations troops in and around the temple, which is absolutely an act of sacrilege in the mind of, of uh, any Jew, that's not the worst of it. He bans sacrifices and all temple worship, other religious observances that are critical to the law of Moses and Jewish identity, the Sabbath, circumcision, kosher laws of what we're going to eat and not eat, they're all prohibited. He takes scrolls of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and he has them publicly burned. In December of 167, he erects what is described in 1 Maccabees as a desolating sacrilege on the altar of burnt offering. We would 
describe that as he takes a pig and he offers it in worship to Zeus on the altar outside of the temple in Jerusalem. Daniel puts it this way, or that heavenly figure to Daniel puts it this way, more than 400 years ahead of time. At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before, for ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the holy covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsook or who forsake the holy covenant. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. What's being communicated there is if you're willing to compromise who you are as a Jew and be one of his people, he'll let you live, right? But he's also galvanizing Jews who are not willing to bend to his will. And that is where that famous Maccabean revolt of the Jews comes into effect. The wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble, stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help. And many shall join themselves to them with flattery, and some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. In fact, absolutely fascinating, we have coins today with his image on it. It's got his name on one side and in Greek on the other side it says God manifest or God revealed. Think about that. This man puts his own picture and his own name on a coin and says this is God manifest or God revealed. He shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these, a god whom his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. At the time of the end, the king of the, the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. He shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall. But these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver. And all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him. And he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. This man, of course, even this man, eventually loses his life. Now, obviously, we are nearly out of time. But I want you to think about, like we said, 135 different predictions in one chapter of the Bible. There is absolutely no other chapter like it from Genesis to Revelation. It goes from Persia all the way through the life of this man. But just by way of putting this into the larger perspective, 
What ought the people of God to take away from this? Alan? It, they will reveal the truth. Okay. The second chapter, second verse of this chapter. Yeah. Yeah. God is willing to put it before us. God is telling the truth. Not just about what had already happened, but what would happen. This was the truth. And historically, we understand it. It happened, right? What ought the people of God to take away from this enormous prophecy that makes our heads spin? We ought to understand what Christ means to us. Okay. All of this is ultimately leading to the coming of the Christ. Mark? The kingdoms of this world will come to an end. Yeah. Each and every one. Each and every one, including modern day kingdoms. Right? Kingdoms of men are nothing compared to the kingdom of God. Other folks. Andrew? It's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. Every time an army passes through there, they didn't have a supply chain running down I-70. They were eating your food. Yeah. They're killing your house. They're, you know, your stuff, they're eating every single time. Yeah. It was about 30 times in that chapter. An army goes one way or the other or comes back. Yeah. And you're paying for it. Yeah. And it's devastating yeah. if you're a Jew in Jerusalem or the surrounding area. And of course, the question that naturally would arise is the question that all of us would have. Where is God in the midst of all of this? Has God forgotten his people? And this is God's way of saying far ahead of time. God has not forgotten his people. His people are going through difficult times because they wouldn't listen to it, right? But God has not forgotten. And from the smoldering embers that are Jerusalem at that point in time, the greatest blessing of all is going to God, right? Thank you so much for being here this evening. I appreciate you being patient. I tried to make that as easy as I possibly could. If you'd like to talk more about it or you'd like some recommended resources, if this is your sort of thing, let me know and I can give them to you. Thank you.